This webinar was presented by Dr. Mark Stemmler on October 31st, 2019. It consists of an 80-minute presentation followed by a question and answer period. Okay, hello everyone and welcome to the Methodology Center session, our one-in-one -one today. Um, if you are new to this format, uh, welcome and we are very happy to have you. So again, hello, I am Bethany Bray, and I am the former associate director here at the Methodology Center and am now at the Center for Dissemination and Implementation Science at the University of Illinois at Chicago. I am very pleased to welcome you um, to this one-in-one -one session with our very good friend, Mark Stemmler, here with us today. Um, Mark is going to be presenting a really interesting session on person-centered analyses, specifically configural frequency analysis. And Mark, we are so lucky to have him joining us here from his sabbatical in Germany. He has visited us many times and given um, many uh, uh, workshops and short courses on this topic. And um, if you're not as familiar with Mark's work, uh, please do check out his book, on this exact same topic. It's um, available as kind of a, a brief mm -hmm. book, uh, yeah. which I think is also available online. Is it? Not? It's available as an ebook. Ebook, yeah. perfect. So everybody should have a chance to check that out. Um, so the way that this format works, for those of you who are new, um, Mark is actually going to be switching screens several times. So he has a slideshow and then is also going to be sharing some computer code. And as we switch between the slides, it, it will just take a few seconds to get the right screen up every time. Um, if you have any trouble at all uh, with the audio or video, please feel free to log off and log back in. We do have a one hour session today, followed by a one hour question and answer. And the way that that will work is as you um, get questions throughout the course of the lecture, please submit them via the chat window. And during the hour long question and answer session, um, we will take a brief two minute break um, for us to get set up for the question and answer. And then I will read the questions one at a time um, so that Mark can answer them here live. And uh, when we're done with questions, then we will call it a day. If you have questions about the procedure, please feel free also to use the chat box and I will be able to respond. So with that, I don't want to take up any more of Mark's time. Very, very pleased to introduce Dr. Mark Semler. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bethany, for having me and thank you, Aaron, for organizing this webinar. Um, so I will talk about configurable frequency analysis and here I have a, here I have a advanced organizer um, which leads us through the one hour, maybe a little more than one hour. So I will talk about what is configurable frequency analysis. This is a very complicated name. Then I will give briefly a theoretical background for all of you who are working in developmental psychology. There's a nice uh, theory behind the person-centered approach. Then I will start introducing all kinds of CFAs, configurable frequency analysis, first order, prediction CFA, and the, how can we use covariates in CFA, two sample CFA, and then I will also talk about the close relationship between CFA and log linear modeling. And of course, one major thing is that there is a very interesting and easy to use R package available called CONFRAC. Okay, um, for those who are used to work with means and variances and uh, correlations, we have to shift a little bit in our mind. We have to think about configurations or patterns. And I will give a couple of examples so that we get into the mood of thinking of configurations or patterns. There's a very famous theory of crime by P.O. Olaf Wickström, uh, University of Cambridge, it's called Situation Action Theory. And he basically says that crime, as you can see here, is the result of a, person, a person's propensity times the criminogenic exposure. So if we have, what, what are typical propensities 
for crime. So that means low morality and low self-control or high impulsivity. So if a person, you know, has low morality and low self-control or high impulsivity, and this person lives in an environment where there are lots of opportunities to commit crimes, yeah, if you can buy or sell drugs at the corner of the street, then this will result in crime. So this is a criminogenic configuration, high propensity, high environment exposure and crime. So plus, plus, plus is a typical criminogenic configuration. But I have more examples. Um, this is from a study I did together with Gerhard Bäumler, True Data. Uh, we looked at a list of athletes in Germany, yeah, more than 6,000 athletes, and we selected them and stratified them according to their surname. And you have to know that in the medieval ages, in Germany at least, they started out assigning surnames to people according to their profession. Yeah? So if you were a tailor, your surname would become Taylor. Or if you were a Smith, blacksmith, then your last name was Smith. So in those times, um, Smiths, Taylors, Webbers, Bakers, Millers, they were all organized in professional association called guilds. And guilds means that the son of a tailor would also became a tailor. And all the families were of tailors and smiths separately, but all together were organized in guilds. <clears throat> so that also the daughter of a smith would marry a male smith at the time. So this keeps the profession within the family and it's a the thing that um, what as a result there's a certain inbreeding of populations and this is still something that you can observe in today's society in Germany and it was even replicated in Austria. So what you can see is that you see among the top ranking athletes of heavyweight branches of athletics where you need body strength and body height, there were relative more persons that go by the name of Smith. The German name is Schmied. In the light branches, lightweight branches of athletics, which are more stamina demanding, more people go by the name of Taylor. And here you can see, uh, and you can pick and choose who is the Taylor and who is Schneider in German or the uh, Smith. So this person here, Wolfgang Schmied, He's a very famous athlete. He was a disco thrower. Disco thrower. He tried to flee from the GDR across the uh, Iron Curtain and he got caught and went into prison. But after the Germany was reunified, he also was very successful in European athlete competitions. So the body build, yeah, there's a typical configuration for Smith and typical body build configuration for tailors. I have two more examples, or three actually, to get you in the mood of thinking of patterns or configurations. This is true, this is what we call in Germany Dieselgate. Um, the Volkswagen company uh, came up with the cheating software um, in order to e reduce the exhaust fumes, in order to re reduce uh, the carbon dioxide, for their diesel engines. And because they advertise them as blue diesel, the blue uh, planet Earth is a blue planet. And, um, but in fact, there were no <laughs> uh, environmentally uh, um, appropriate cars because they were really uh, putting a lot of exhaust fumes into the air. But in order to pass the governmental emission test, they had a software that was looking for a certain configuration. And this configuration, configuration was indicating that the car was on the testing side and not in the streets. The configuration was only one axis was turning with a constant speed 
and there were no headwinds and the temperature was also constant. That was the configuration that started the software. So nowadays, in Germany at least, they changed the tests and you can only drive a car now in real, in real life in, in the streets. This is, um, you can see this is multidisciplinary. This is something from hydrobiology, um, where people from Austria, Melcher, Lauch and Schmutz, they investigated um, a branch river of the Danube in terms of uh, the of a functional and healthy ecosystem. <laughs> so a functional and healthy ecosystem like a river needs a certain amount of fish. And they were looking for this fish over here. It's a sort of a trout. It's called Nase. And that's the German word for nose. And you can see this trout obviously has a very specific nose. So what does the Nase fish love? For a for you know for mating and and producing offsprings, high flow velocity of the water, fine and coarse substrate of the riverbed. Obviously, this fish loves bubbling water, and no sun. They prefer a shade and riverbank. So this is a typical configuration. They were actually uh, counting the fish. You know, they put out nets and. Uh, counted the fish and threw them back into the water and um, that's how they came up with the configurable frequency analysis of the NASA. And, and one and last example, um, this was published by two, two Turkish uh, guys, uh, researchers in the Journal of Agriculture and Veterinary Sciences. <clears throat> they looked at the causes of the death of cattle calves. Um, so what they did, they came up with a number of characteristics of the barn system, for instance, separation of mothers and calves or joint rearing, type of disease, three kinds of diseases, intestinal disease, respiratory disease, trauma, vaccination status, vaccinated versus unvaccinated, and sex. And there was a specific configuration for the cause of the death of cattle calves. Cattle calves die more often than expected if they have an intestinal disease, are not vaccinated, and if the mothers are kept with the calves in the barn. The gender of the calf was irrelevant. So you see, now from now on, we only think in terms of patterns. Three slides for the theoretical background for those who are interested in developmental psychology. You don't have to use this theoretical, uh, theoretical background if you don't want to, like the hydrobiologists, they never use it. But if you are in psychology and you have a lifespan perspective, this is a very interesting addition to the statistical tool. So this theory was developed by the working group around David Magnusson in Stockholm, Sweden. Um, and they say, well, human beings are seen as a complex dynamic system, which could be understood ideally only under the holistic interactionist approach. What does it mean? That it means humans are seen as inseparable units embedded in their context but who try to be active producers of their development. <clears throat> I think this is a really nice view. This is Lars Bergman. Um, he summarized three major characteristics of this interactionist holistic view. The individual organism can be thoroughly understood only as a whole, not as a sum of fragmented elements. The unit of person-centered analysis is indivisible and can thus be studied most fruitfully, taking a holistic perspective and the key principle of functioning and development of an integrated individual 
a set of functional interactions. I'm not going into detail of the theory, but if you are interested, there's more to read if you look for the papers of Lars Bergman and um, David Magnussen. So, what is what are the consequences of such a let's say holistic and interactionist approach? Is that we don't analyze means or variances like in the variable centered approach we use the unit of analysis is uh, our persons animals objects or other units and we call this person centered approach and those object person animals can be arranged into a multi-way contingency table and there we look for very interesting, significant patterns or configurations. <clears throat> Configurable frequency analysis, very complicated name, was invented by Gustav A. Lienert in the 60s as a tool for the analysis of contingency tables. So the analysis of multidimensional cost tables had many applications and I will mention three of them. As mentioned before, we are not looking at scale scores, but at cell frequencies. Yeah, we're looking for persons or units with characteristic patterns or configurations. <clears throat> Thank God, CFA has only a few requirements with regard to sample size. And the underlying sampling distribution is the multinomial distribution instead of the normal distribution. I'm sorry for having only a German uh, picture of a nice cross tab. So we are analyzing multi-way contingency tables. In such tables, persons, animals, or objects are grouped into disjunct, exclusive categories based on their respective patterns or configurations. And this is now very important. The underlying logic is the comparison of observed frequencies with expected frequencies. Yeah? And maybe you have uh, already learned something about analyzing a two by two table using a chi square value. Well, this is a good start because comparing observed with expected frequencies is something that is used in first order CFA. So here is um, an example of a chi-square square, um, statistic um, with rows, columns, and space, three dimensions, three dimensional cross table. So we have here observed frequencies minus expected frequencies squared divided by the expected frequencies. And here we use the point index notation that means that the dots denote the observed frequencies of a column, for instance, or here of a row. <clears throat> well, to, if we are dealing with chi-square values, we are dealing with degrees of freedom, and here is a formula for any possible contingency table to calculate the degrees of freedom, T, represents the number of cells or configurations, d the number of dimensions or variables, and um, v with the subscript of d the number of categories of a variable. So if we have t equals eight cells, three variables, each dichotomous, we have four degrees of freedom. Because in the R package, next to the chi-square value, also the goodness of fit statistic likelihood ratio chi-square will be listed. I'm also listing this um, formula. It's a little bit more complicated, but uh, the likelihood ratio test is well known and well respected. Here we have the natural logarithm for base E, and E is um, the abbreviation of the German mathematician Euler, and it's a, it's a constant. 
what are the underlying hypotheses? So for first order CFA, the null hypothesis is saying that there is no significant association between the variables involved or the variables are independent of each other. So the null hypothesis of a first order CFA is the assumption of independence. Now let's say we have a two by two table, smoking status, yes, no, and the other variable is lung cancer, yes, no, the null hypothesis would assume that there is no association between smoking and cancer status. And of course, for in the research, we would like to reject the null hypothesis and to accept the alternative hypothesis, which says that the variables involved are not independent of each other. So there's some kind of a connection. So a CFA based on the assumption of independence is called first order CFA. Okay, um, the null hypothesis has direct, direct impact on the expected frequencies. In the expected frequencies, we find the null hypothesis and in first order CFA, the expected frequencies are calculated based on the assumption of independence, which is the so-called base model. Okay, we go to the next page. And here you see, this is the um, statistical hypothesis, null hypothesis, basically saying that you can calculate the cell frequencies from the marginal, sum of marginals. This is the way we calculate the expected frequencies for three-dimensional table and can be easily extended to four and five-dimensional tables. You would never run a CFA on a two by two table. Yeah? This is, you need, we are talking about multi way contingency tables. Okay, so we have the assumption of independence. This drives the way we calculate the expected frequencies. Then they are compared to observed frequencies. And we have the so-called global chi-square and the likelihood ratio test. And they are for the whole table. They are goodness of fit statistics for the whole table. And if those statistics turn out to be significant, that means that we can look on the local level for a local significant chi-square. And here's the formula for a local chi-square with one degrees of freedom. Okay, so we, we reject the null hypothesis, we get a significant global chi-square, then we look for local chi-square values which are significant, and then we can find types or antitypes. What does it mean? So types or antitypes, or as Wickens in his famous book on multivariate contingency table, uh, he called them outlandish cells. Types means that the, the cells are over-frequented. We have more observed yeah, than expected frequencies, significantly more. If it's the other way around, we have less observed than expected, and then we call them antitypes. So CFA, is the search, the hunt for types and antitypes. Next to the local chi-square, I prefer to use the chi-square approximation of the t-test, and here's the formula. And later on, I will show you the R package. There are even many more statistics mentioned, but uh, so for this session, we will only look at the c-value. Okay, now we come to a real data example. 
the uh, Erlangen University Clinic for children when they called me and they say, well, they have a really nice data set, but a small sample and they don't know how to analyze it. And I said, okay, let's have a look at it. And they had, I guess, 57 children prematurely born and they had a couple of variables, um, which are very interesting, categorical variables. For instance, epileptic seizures. So if the child had any yes or no epileptic seizures after birth, birth weight above 1000 grams or below. This is not an arbitrary um, distinction. This is very, it has a medic medical meaning. So below 1000 grams is very low birth weight. And then they looked at the intelligence at the age of five measured with a normal IQ. And here we divided the continuous variable into above average of intelligence and below average. So we wanted to see if there is a healthy combination or a detrimental combination of birth weight and epileptic seizures in terms of the intelligence development at the age of five. And here we have a table um, that we, that is the basis for all CFAs. This is what we call tabulated data for pattern frequencies. What is a pat, uh, tab, um, tabulated data? A tabulated data is a data table where the rows consist of the patterns or configuration. Yeah, so we have no seizures above 1,000 grams and above average. And the last column uh, consists of the observed frequencies. So in order to analyze the data, we need to come up with such a tabulated data. And of course, you can see here that Thank God, many of those had, were above the mean uh, average intelligence. They had no seizures and they were, their birth weight was, although they were prematurely born, above 1,000 grams. That doesn't mean that this is with the highest cell is automatically a type or that those with small numbers are antitypes. We will see later on. On the next page, you can see that. So we have actually one type. So we have more observed than expected. And here we have the C value, and it's highly significant. That means that this is a typical configuration. And have a look at the, this configuration. So this, those children have seizures. They were below the thousand grams and below average of intelligence. Yeah? It doesn't mean that it's not possible to be above, I mean, but there were only two, and the configura configura frequency suggests that this is an important type. And now the clinic in Erlangen, the children's clinic, they if they have babies with a low birth weight and seizures, they start consulting the parents that they should you know, invest more in the development of the intelligence of the children. Well, there were other um, markers that were not significant. For instance, if the child was intubated at birth, yes or no, intubation had nothing to do with the intelligence. One, ex one advantage of CFA is that you can use it for small samples. As I mentioned before, here we have only 57 children. And let's say the IQ is measured on an interval level and we have two independent variables for a analysis of variance, seizures and birth weight. And this is, so we have four cells and if everything is equally distributed, we would have 14 children in each cell, but this is not much. Yeah, We need uh, to have more children in each cell. 
And so the person-centered approach has the following advantages. It can be applied to small samples, can even be applied if there are zero cells, cells with nobody in it, but it's good not to have too many zero cells, otherwise you have sparse data. And we don't have to worry about the normal distribution or homogeneous variances. Okay, now I would like to introduce to you uh, CONFRAC, the R package. Small introduction to R for those who have never heard of R, but maybe after the session you would like to use it. R is an open source software which is suitable for Linux, um, Mac, Macintosh, and uh, Windows uh, computers. It uh, was developed by the R development core team. Uh, actually was developed in Austria. And it's an open source software that means that everybody can see the code of each program. This is usually uh, hidden if you use SAS or any other software packages. R requires a syntax which works step by step, restoring immediate results into objects. And objects can be one number, can be a data frame or vector or something. In R, the objects can be modified for personal use and plotted easily. It's, R is becoming more and more popular in the field of methodology, partially because R is also easy to connect with LaTeX. So if you're interested in the software R, we can download um, the base uh, software. Uh, you just need to look for a CRAN server in your environment. So if you go on, to, on this web page, yeah, there's not only one server of R in the world, but there are many mirrored uh, servers and you can easily select the one in your geographical neighborhood. There are in also very good websites for help. This is a nice website for help. And then uh, I would prefer uh, to use uh, or suggest to you that you use R together with an extra editor, for instance, Tin R, you can find here, or R Studio. I use R Studio. Uh, both of the editors are of no cost, and so is the software. <clears throat> okay, R is easy to use and very suitable for beginners. It works if you use RStudio as I do with four windows. Um, so there's one window for your R script, and then there's a workspace, and there's a window called console, which is the direct feedback from the server. And then there's a, a window for documentation and packages. If you want to use configure frequency analyzer or to, to analyze, to run CFA, download the package CONFRAC from um, the CRAN server. We use the name CONFRAC not in order to mix it up with confirmatory factor analysis, which is also abbreviated CFA. The program CONFRAC was written by Jörg Hendrik Heine from the University of Munich. And at the end of my presentation, I will show you my email address or Jörg's email address in case you have any questions regarding CONFRAC. Okay, now I switch uh, the screen. Let's see if that works. Here we go. <clears throat> so here we have our studio with the four windows. Here is the, the R script window. Here we have the console. Here we have the environment or the workspace, which at the moment is clean. It was brushed here. And here we have the packages. So before, uh, so, you know, so after you have installed our studio and 
um, the base package of R, then you can search for packages. For instance, so here you would type in confreg, you know, and if you type in a couple of letters, you will get suggestions. And here, this is a suggestion, and then you install it. But I installed it before. After, you have to only install it once, but then you have to load it, yeah. Um, every time you 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 know load a program by checking the mark over here, and here there's given a sort of a small help session um, help manual, so you can see um, many of the things of the package are explained to you. So you will see that you need only four lines to analyze a config frequency analysis. And I think this is very easy to use. So, um, first of all, if you're not familiar with R, you need to set a working directory. You can do this easily with uh, RStudio. You go to session, set working directory, and then you choose the directory um, because the, the R scripts and the data need to be in one directory. So here I would use, I use this Penn State workshop R scripts and data and I selected this directory. And as I mentioned before, we can analyze only tabulated data and I prefer to write those tabulated data in Excel. Can you see that? The Excel, okay. So here is the Excel sheet. Oh, wait, sorry. No, oh, sorry. okay. So the RStudio window, sorry. Okay, so I go back. Okay, yeah, no, okay, no. so. So I typed in the, the table that I have shown you before in Excel as tabulated data, so the lines are the configurations and the last column are the frequencies. In order to analyze an Excel sheet in Confreg, it has to be of the format comma, comma separated values. That's very important, you know, don't save it under XLS or whatever. You basi basically have to come up with a um, text-based table. So if you save the data, then make sure that you specify the type over here. Yeah, so so it's comma separated value. Okay. We'll go back to the R Studio. And here it's line six. The other lines starting with the hashtag are comments. Yeah, and you can put in as many comments as you like. So here it says, um, read the table, and the table is watch out. Um, R is very case sensitive because it was written by German speaking uh, researchers. Comma separated value. Well, in Germany, on, on Europe, we use as a separator a semicolon. So if you are in Asia or in Northern America, you use a comma. And um, the header is true, so it will be printed out. And so I will start this line by um, and either mark this line and say run. Or you put the cursor over here and then you hit the uh, control and enter button. So here you can see there's now an object called CFA. It consists of eight observations, patterns, and four variables. Okay, now this is the, this line 10 is very important in order to prepare the data for the function of CFA written in Confreg. It's, um, you know, data to frequency, frequency to data. 
And here in the console, you see the answer. So this is now a pattern frequency. And this is the fourth and only line you need. You write everything in the object re re results, yeah, data one, form. And here comes an equation. And you, those who are familiar with R, you can use it also in the um, uh, general linear modeling uh, approach. If you use a multiple regression, it's a till design. And then you punch in the three variables, the seizures plus birth weight plus intelligence. And then you actually run a first order CFA where the expected frequencies are calculated based on the assumption of independence. And they are compared with the observed frequencies. Everything is now in results d1 and if you want to get a nice printout you can see it over here i extend the lower window first of all we get the results of the global tests chi-squared test is significant e means that this number here is um, multiplied or has the um, exponent of one divided a number with seven zeros, so it will be one by one million. So this is highly, highly significant. This is the likely ratio test. And here is also nice you get information criteria. This is important in, in case you are comparing different CFA results and you would like to go with this result where there's the lower big and a, a chi key values. Here we see the pattern. We have the observed frequencies, we have the expected frequencies, and here is the column where you can find either a plus sign type or a minus sign anti-type. And here you can see all the different um, um, statistics where I like to use, prefer to use this chi-square approximation of this C value. Here is the type. So seven observed. You have, of, of course, you have to have in mind what what is in one, what is, in, is two, and here are the expected frequencies. So there are many more observed seven than expected frequencies, and this is considered a type because we are doing multiple testing. Here we have Bonfer the Bonferroni adjustment. Sometimes. It results in a very small number, then I would say you are allowed to have a look at the statistics who are significant at the 5% level in terms of exploratory reasons, because they are also in and of itself very interesting. But here we have only one. So if you like the R script, I would like to show you one more thing. Um, it was one of my students here at Penn State who sent me a the same thing using uh, the so he beefed it up with a mark down um, thing and and that gets you really really nice uh, outprint. I would like to show you uh, this was a student called Wen from China. Um, so here again, it's a little bit less. Um, easy to read if you're not familiar with R, but here you can read the table. And then if you use this here, this is a really nice thing, markdown, you get a really, really nice table. You see, nice to see, seizures, birth, and you get the past pattern frequencies. And over here, So you see, you can really, with R, R is a very flexible tool, costs nothing. You, there are not many things in life which cost nothing and you can do many things with it. <laughs> Here you can see the patterns, there's nicely displayed, observed frequencies expected. There's a type, only one type over here. And here you have all the nice statistics. 
Okay, are there already questions or shall I move on? Um, there is one question so mm -hmm. far that um, I can I can ask you if you can repeat it because I'm not. Um, what? <laughs> let me um, let me ask you the question and you can repeat it. So the question is about how many variables are useful as inputs for the CFA? Is ah, there okay. a minimum requirement? Okay, also how many variables are useful? For CFA, is there a minimum requirement? Yeah, that's a very good question. So, as I mentioned before, I would never run a CFA with only two variables. So you have to have at least three. And I would say um, between three and five, this is a very nice size. Because imagine if you have five variables, dichotomous variables, it means it's two by two by two by two by two. So it's 32 cells. And if you have, let's say, you can also use variables with more than two levels, yeah, three or four, then you get a really, really big table. And um, so it, it means you have to have also a lot of data. I mean, also you can have a number of uh, zero cells, but not too many. Otherwise, the reviewer will say you have sparse data and collect more data and come back. So between three and five is very nice. Otherwise, the table gets too big. Um, another question regarding what you just were asking. Um, you mentioned that incubation had no role on the telogen. How did you figure that out? Um, well, it's because um, there was, uh, shall I repeat it or? Yes. Okay, yes. So, so the question was why uh, incubation was not relevant in terms of um, um, intelligence. Well, it was in terms of configured frequency analysis, there was no type coming up with this variable included yeah so you would see that let's say they are intelligent children or independent of the fact that they were intubated or not so i was told later on by the the medical doctors that it, intubation affects the lungs and seizures the brain so obviously it's also a matter of the uh, medical uh, yeah, thing involved. So related, um, how do you decide which variables to keep for the final model regarding the HDF? Okay, so yeah, how do I decide which more uh, variables I keep for the final model? So this is uh, something that is not related to CFA. You can always ask this question. Um, um, so first of all, if you have a good theory, that would help to select variables. And um, otherwise, if I would see that, let's say, there are you know, patterns coming up uh, independent of the variable. So it doesn't matter if the variable uh, you know, it has a one or a two or a three. Every time there is a significant pattern, that means that um, this um, pattern is not, um, this variable is not, um, not uh, yeah, it's not helpful and it's not significantly related. So this variable is obviously independent of the other variables. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I okay, so I move on. Okay, now we, we are doing a little bit of statistics. Um, configured frequency analysis is closely related to log linear modeling. And I will briefly uh, describe this uh, relationship. So mm -hmm. some of you might want to run CFA and log linear modeling together. You can do this. Then you're looking at two sides of the same coin. Okay, so both use the same approach in terms of comparing observed with expected frequencies. Yeah? So log linear models can be used to investigate the patterns of association or the structure of dependency among the variables. And so if you want to know, are there main effects and interactions and what kind of interactions you would look at log linear modeling. So what are main effects in terms of a contingency table? They are in 
Actually, they're really boring main effects. They only indicate that the marginal sums are not homogeneous, they're heterogeneous. So this is not very interesting. Interactions means that the, either the main diagonal of the cell or the off diagonal, uh, diagonal cell is outlandish. Is you know there are many objects, persons, animals in those cells. So interactions are more interesting. The expected frequencies are calculated by the generalized linear model. The general linear model, who are you are most uh, familiar with, I guess, is a special case of the generalized linear model. So here is the generalized linear model. So you basically, on the left side, you have what we are calling the link function. Yeah? And on the right side here, we have the independent variables, matrix of independent variables, x and beta are the vectors of the parameters. So if you're running um, multiple regression, yeah, so you see that y is y and nothing else but y. This is why we call this in the general linear model the identity function. In terms of multiple regression, we have a constant, we have predictors and weights and residuals, and the only assumption we are doing is, uh, or the assumptions are that the residuals need to have a mean of zero and homo scatasticity, a homogeneous variance. The parameters in terms of matrix algebra are calculated like this. And in the generalized linear model, the link function is a log link. Yeah, so we calculate the expected frequencies based on the natural logarithm. And then instead of using or confusing the beta weights with multiple regression, we are using lambdas. So here, this is a log linear model, a saturated model of two variables. We have here also a constant. We have an effect parameter for variable A and B and the interaction. And instead of using Y, we have now M. And M is the logarithm of the expected values. You see that nothing else has changed. In the design matrix, there are effect coded main effects and interactions plus a constant. Yeah? And the nice thing of Confreg and Rürg did a great job is that you actually can change, manipulate the design matrix. And that, that makes CFA really flexible. But anyway, we are still comparing observed frequencies with expected frequencies, and then we calculate a global chi-square, which needs to be significant in order to find types or anti-types. Or oh, here also the likelihood ratio chi-square was also significant. So there was not a, good, uh, not a good fit. So we are happy in terms of CFA because that means there are significant cells, types, or antitypes. Okay, now um, we move on. So there are different ways of running a CFA. The traditional, most often used CFA is the first order CFA based on the assumption of independence, but there are nice varieties. One is the prediction CFA. And the prediction CFA is something I would always use if you have longitudinal data, because then you can say, okay, I have a number of variables here, let's say A, B, and C, and I declare the C vari variable as the criterion, which is measured later on than the predictors. Yeah, let's say C was measured at time two, A and B were measured at time one. Then, in order to come up or have a better argument for a causal uh, relationship, you can basically put up the threshold of the null hypothesis by saying, okay, um, I'm not satisfied with only the main effects model, but I would like to, to change the null hypothesis such that the predictors are saturated in themselves. 
Yeah, so I add the interaction A times B. So if this null hypothesis is rejected, it means there must be in the data any relationship with the outcome variable. This is a strong argument. Yeah? So prediction CFA can also be used if you have, let's say, more than one variable as the dependent variable. Only the predictors in the criterion, the criteria needs to be saturated. And if then you you know, reject the null hypothesis, any type or anti-type has to do with the outcome variable. It's very interesting. We have real data from the Erlang Nuremberg Development and Prevention Study. The PI is Friedrich Schlösel. Um, it's a longitudinal analysis on the antisocial development of children from kindergarten to uh, elementary school. We have gender, we have externalizing and internalizing behavior rated by the kindergarten teachers. Here we use not the median but the 75th percentile. And the criterion is externalizing behavior in the classroom. In elementary school, we were able to analyze transcripts of the children um, in the first two years of their elementary school years. Okay, this is the table, the tab-related data. We have males and females. We have minus and plus in terms of externalized and internalized behavior. And we are looking for stability of externalizing behavior from kindergarten to elementary school. Oops. Um, I will use the second R example. Oh, you got a question. You okay. One question? Sure. Um, just out of curiosity, why is CFA appropriate for small n? Does this mean that power is not an issue for CFA? <laughs> that, and so the question is why is CFA appropriate for small n? Isn't power an issue for CFA? Um, I have to say that I would say it's not that big of an issue as for the variable oriented approach. Yeah, so, um, the, so you don't have to worry about normal distribution because the distribution that you analyze is generated out of your data. And you can find actually types, anti types, even if you have a small. The small data set, it depends on how the data set is distributed. This is a very good question about the power issue. Mm -hmm. And also, um, when having a large N, do you have any improvement for CFA results? Um, so <laughs> I would say not so much in terms of power, also, it's not uh, always not bad to have large data. Um, it, it's it's good that you can come up with, if you like, more than five variables. Yeah, And of course, if you have a large data set, uh, you can have always a good argument in terms of that the data is represented of the population. OK, great. So here we go. So we have CFA. So here, line nine, we read in the data. And I switch one more time to show you um, the data. Okay, yeah, so it's always the standard. So you punch in the data into Excel sheet using the comma separated value format and you save it under this format. Then you can, uh, can be easily, uh, you know, read in by this read table, which is basically a text file. Okay. And you can see here below that, you know, we have the data in a tabulated form. And here is in line 16, we have now the confreq, the function. And here you can see that we use 
three predictors, gender, externalizing, and internalized behavior at time one, and the asterisk between the variables indicate that we are that the, the predictors are saturated. So using an asterisk means that we have all the main effects, we have all the two-way interactions and the three-way interaction. And here plus means independent of the criterion variable. So you can control, return, and the result. So you see here now the global chi-squares likelihood ratio Pearson chi-square are significant. Unfortunately, the Bonferroni adjustment is very strong, a very low number, and that means that here we have only one significant type. Um, I asked Jörg to work on a different um, alpha adjustment, maybe the Holmes adjustment, which is a little bit uh, more lenient than the Bonferroni adjustment. But so far we have only the Bonferroni adjustment, which, which leads to one type. And But I also would like to, for exploratory reasons, I like to look at the 5% level types. Here is one for the boys, 14 and 8. And So here we go. We have here the Bonferroni adjusted anti-type. Anti this is for females. So there are less females, 10, than expected, 23, who have no signs of antisociality in kindergarten, but have something in their classroom transcripts. This here was more interesting for us in terms of antisocial ability. Those boys were you know showed externalizing behavior in kindergarten and in elementary school independent of whether they had internalizing problems or not okay so the overall um chi square was significant it's good that means they are there's at least one type or anti-type there were two types for boys, at least on the 5% level, representing a risk pattern for stable externalizing behavior. The one with no internalizing behavior were consisting of 6% of the boys and the other of 3.6%. And it's then possible to analyze those boys in further analysis to have a look at what are their characteristics. The antitype emerged only for girls, saying that it's unlikely to have um, classroom behavior problems in elementary school, but not in kindergarten school. Okay, so we used first order CFA, now prediction CFA, but it's also possible to use moderated CFA. And moderated CFA is if you look at the variables without, for instance, looking at gender. So we would assume that the patterns or configurations are equally distributed for boys as for girls. That means you have the same predicted values for boys than for girls. And this was done in the next two lines. And here we have a moderated Prediction CFA, you can see here in the equation, the variable gender is missing. There's only interaction between internalized and externalized behavior. Okay, let's have a look at the observed frequencies. And you can see here the first um, eight lines are for the boys, and then here we have girls, and here are the expected frequencies 111. 111, 21, like you see. 
a moderated CFA assumes the same expected frequencies for two groups, boys and girls. And what you can see here that the antisocial stable patterns came out only for boys. And that is a significant gender difference, which you might then want to interpret. Okay, um, are there questions for a prediction CFA? So, because the next topic is covariates in CFA. So, let's say you have a mixture of continuous and categorical variables. You can now use, and this is a big advantage, also continuous variables. Oh, one, okay. One um, is there a recommended way to format data into the pattern matrix that is needed for data? Um, you, yeah, I am recommended way means for me, there's only one way, the, the way of tabulated data. That means you have, you know, order for conflict at least, you have to come up with tabulated data such that the lines represent patterns and the last column the frequencies. Yeah. So this is the only way you can read in the data. And can the moderators also be multi-level? And the moderators also be multi-level, of course, yeah. Let's say you have three uh, categories like uh, lower SES, middle SES, and upper and high SES. Then you would assume for each level of socioeconomic status, you would assume the name the same frequency. There's a third question. I can see that on there. Yes, there's one more. <laughs> Can you please repeat the information about Bonferroni adjustment? I am familiar with Bonferroni adjustment in the context of multiple comparisons, mm -hmm. but not CFA. Okay, yeah, and so I should repeat uh, Bonferroni adjustment. And this person that uh, uh, is familiar with Bonferroni in terms of multiple testing, but not in CFA. But that's actually the same concept. So, um, so we basically looking for types and anti-types and actually we are conducting multiple tests. Yeah. So in terms of coming up with hypothesis testing, we have to take care of the adjusted alpha level. So the built-in procedure is Bonferroni. So we divide the alpha level of 5% by the number of cells that can, you know, if you have 16 or 32 cells come up with a very, very small Bonferroni alpha level which is hard to you know compete with so we we hope to come up with alternatives for instance the Holm adjustment but it's not programmed in here okay covariates here's the a little bit of statistics um, as before the logarithm of the natural logarithm of the expected values is a linear function of uh, the design matrix and the parameters. Now there's an addition over here. So we have a covariate vector and a parameter for the covariate. Covariates are simply added as a column with the design matrix of the log linear base model. And we'll later show you, it can easily be shown in um, Confrag. Well, what do you use as, as a continuous covariate? So you use, for instance, the cell mean yeah, of a configuration. Yeah? Or you, I've only used mean so far, but you can also use the median percentage probabilities or other theoretically defined contrasts. But one number represents a pattern. Yeah? So I heard objections saying, well, that means that you treat all the people in this one configuration, we have only number as equal. Yeah, that's, that's true. So if you have information that this number is not a good representation in terms of the covariate. 
you should think about something else. You can put in as many covariates if you like. You always invest one degree of freedom. And if you put in very good covariates, this, ha this has a result, this covariate results in a significant effect parameter. And if you have a good one, that means that you move the expected cell frequencies closer to the observed frequency. And that means that you might want that you might end up losing one or the other type because a, a, you know, a smaller difference between expected and observed results in a better fit. This is a little bit uh, contrary to our normal co covariance analysis of covariance, where we usually have a more clear picture, more significant result in terms of the adjusted uh, means. Yeah? So here it's different. If you have a good covariate, you might lose types of antitype. So I will show you briefly the example by Judith Glück. She's a professor at the University of Klagenfurt in Austria. She did, she did a study on 181 Austrian high school students. Um, and they were uh, doing a paper and pencil cube comparison task. One of this, they had to compare two cubes. And the question was, um, are the cubes similar or different? Yeah. And after saying yes or no, they had to come up with the st strategy that they use. So one, they, they could use or um, claim to use three strategies. One is the rotational strategy, a matching rotating one of the for both cubes, yeah? So the, the question is this cube the same as this one? And then they just turned the other cube. And there was one uh, prerequisite that um, no pattern can appear more than one, than on one face of the cube. Yeah, that's also important. Um, it makes it easier. So here, the second strategy was a pattern comparison strategy. And the third strategy was the viewpoint change strategy. And Judith Glück was um, mainly interested in uh, gender differences in the use of the strategies. So we have um, rotational strategy, so we have pattern comparison strategy, viewpoint change strategy. One means the strategy was not present, to, it was present, then we have gender, males and females. This is the table that we are analyzing. Yeah. So we have the strategies here in gender, males and females, and the frequencies. And here we have a number of covariates. I will not explain them all, but very interesting was item difficulty. Uh, you know how difficult was the specific task, and. Um, spatial ability score, uh, right-handedness, uh, and so on. I'll show you. The covariance, and then it's okay. Line six, we read in the data from the Excel sheet. Oops, I don't need to show you the Excel sheet again, but I can if you like. Yeah, so here we have the data, the strategies and gender, and then we come up with a first order CFA. So we have 16 patterns. Here's the alpha adjustment, Bonfroni adjustment is 0 0.003, and we have two types. That means here uh, two is females, that females, um, this pattern here, they use the second strategy, which was, I think, viewpoint change. Oh, no, okay. Um, it's true, no. 
I'm a little bit confused at the moment. See in the data. Okay. Yeah, here we go. I don't know what happened. Okay, here we have antitypes. Yeah, so that means boys and girls, so they are less observed than expected, boys and girls equally, they didn't use any of the three strategies. Yeah, but this is not a gender difference. Here we have a gender difference, is a type, so the girls use more often the V, that's the viewpoint change, and girls use more often the pattern comparison strategy and this is a type for girls where they used pattern comparison and viewpoint change yeah so those two strategies are seemingly very common for girls this is now a type for boys boys seem to um, do more often than expected the rotational strategy so you see Viewpoint change, pattern comparison are more female uh, approaches to spatial ability tasks and rotation for boys. Okay, now we add a second file which includes, yeah, for each pattern, so we have, you see, 16 patterns, we have only one continuous number yeah so this is the item difficulty and you have you know certain other variables and now we can here add it's only one one line here line we add a column of the item difficulty to the existing tabulated data and then we look if if there are some changes in the patterns. And well, no. So item difficulty, so we still have the antitypes over here. We have the types for the girls and the boys. Antitypes were not very interesting, but if we add right-handedness to it, yeah, over here. So this is you know, so we combine the data with two columns. You see, this is now how the design matrix looks. We have here the effect codes, and then we have a column for right-handedness and item difficulty. And now we, we see that we yeah, still have one anti-type and two types, but we lost many types. So that means that we used very good Covariance. Okay, so if, before I go to the last version, there's two samples here. Are there questions regarding um, the covariance? So it's, um, it's actually a question from a couple minutes ago. How are under-identified models handled? <clears throat> um, how are Identified or under identified model candidates. Yeah. So, um, oh, and so, well, basically, if we have, if we still have, I mean, if we don't have any degrees of freedom, we have an identified model. And, um, and if we have degrees of freedom, so we have over identified model. Yeah. Um, so, and uh, so what would under identify means? So, um, I've never thought about it. Um, so, so under identify means that, that there's no one solution, so there are possible yeah. solutions. Yeah. Actually, I've never had thought of it, so I. Oh, yeah. Says, um, if there are two few degrees of freedom. Ah, okay. So, Actually, so if you run out of degrees of freedom, so yes, yeah, yeah, that means 
that you perfectly uh, reproduce the data. So your observed frequencies are equal to the expected frequencies. And that's actually um, doesn't contain any information. Yeah, you have to have at least one degree of freedom. Yeah. So that's an over-parameterized model. That would be yeah. So um, there's also a note that um, I'm going to actually come to the microphone. Okay. Um, for those of you who were asking questions about the data structure, there's a note from Charlie, thank you so much, um, that you can see in the chat window about also applying the DAP to FRE function um, to change a regular data frame into a pattern configuration data frame. Um, so if you're uh, curious about that, the note is in the chat window and you can see the whole response. So thank you so much. Okay, so I move on to the last um, um, version of CFA. And then there's only the summary left. Um, this is called two sample CFA. This is basically the equivalent to a T test. Um, unfortunately, there's only something like a two sample CFA. There's no three and four sa uh, sample CFA yet. Maybe you can ask uh, Jörg to program it. But um, uh, two sample CFA um, means that you can compare two samples in terms of patterns and therefore you can use the two sample CFA um, as a tool for doing evaluations for instance. Yeah? So if you have a, a control group and an invention group and you're looking for what uh, you're looking for specific patterns that would be an indication of the successful intervention, you would like to find them only in the experimental group. We have a small data set um, <clears throat> from um, a colleague called Masendorf. Um, this was a, a group of learning disabled students. Uh, we had a control group and a um, experimental group or training group. The training group uh, was doing enhancing problem solving and reasoning training. Yeah, So uh, both trainings strengthen the student's ability in problem solving and reasoning, whereas the control group um, only received the regular schooling. And the way we came up with the pattern is also interesting because it's also a possibility to, um, to code longitudinal data. So here we have two outcome variables, math and reasoning. We have the control group and the experimental group. And a plus means an incremental change above the median yeah, from time one to time two. So this is also interesting. You can put in change information in the way you are um, coding the data. So here we have control group and experimental group, and here we have the observed frequencies. Here are the expected frequencies, and here we're using only the exact um, test. And here we come up with two types, and types in two sample CFAs are called discrimination types. They are no antitypes. They are called discrimination types because they significantly Significantly, significantly discriminate between the two um, groups. So let's have a look over here. So those students change below the median of reasoning, but here they change in mass abilities above the median over time. Here we have only four controls, but uh, 15 experimental students. That means that this was one outcome of the intervention was that the mass abilities you know were increased in the training group here we have two minuses so we have a below median change in terms of reasoning problem solving and mass abilities and that's more typical for the control group than for the mental so mental group yeah. Um, 
there's a little confusion about interpreting the type and anti-type. In the strategy example, the final model shows two types, but they have different observed frequencies. In earlier examples, some only show anti-type without any types emerging from the CFA and vice versa. How would you interpret the findings about types and anti-types? Would the observed frequency be taken into account in interpreting types and anti-types? Hmm. I don't, I'm not sure whether I understood the question correctly. So, um, so types means that we have more observed than expected frequencies. Yeah. And anti-types means we have significantly less observed than expected. But it's not the case that they are, that they are depending on each other. That doesn't mean if we have any types, they have to be also anti-types. Was that the question? Yeah, so the, I think you addressed it, but Christine tell us if you did not. I think she was asking about the observed frequency yeah. and the expected frequency, I believe. But, I see. Yeah. Okay. Okay, the summary. <clears throat> the person-centered methods are based on the interactionist, actionistic, holistic theory of Magnuson and Bergman. Persons, animals, or objects are assigned to a certain configuration in a multi-way contingency table. These multi-way contingency tables can be analyzed with the help of configurable frequency analysis or log linear modeling. So, um, I have to mention that you can transform every configurable analysis null hypothesis into a log linear model, but not vice versa. So. There's a hierarchy, so, so on the lowest level there's configured frequency, then there's log linear modeling, and um, yeah, if you like, you on the highest level there are latent mixture models. Yeah? Um, CFA belongs to the non-parametric tools, and you can analyze even small samples, a very useful tool is the R package, Confrag. Then there are different useful CFA versions available, first order CFA, prediction CFA, moderated CFA, CFA with covariates, and two sample CFA. Here are our email addresses and, and the one also for your kinder. And um, as uh, Bethany mentioned before, there's the person-centered book as an ebook, but there's also a nice uh, article in the journal, International Journal of Behavioral Development. Perfect. Thank you so much, Mark. This was great. So for those of you uh, still with us, there are many of you, we are going to take a two minute break so that you can submit any additional questions that you have for Mark in the chat window. And we have about 30 minutes to continue our discussion for those of you who are interested. Um, we're going to put it on mute so that we can get things sorted here. Yeah, it's good. Yes. All right. Hello, everyone. We are back. And for the interactive part, thank you all for staying. And Mark and I would like to wish you a very happy Halloween. I am dressed as Lady Captain America and he has a Halloween wishes here. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, so we're gonna, um, so that you can see Mark as we ask the questions, gonna kind of put us in between here. Um, so we did not get any additional questions submitted during the, the break. So if you do have questions for Mark, please let us know. Otherwise, we have a few that I have a few that I'd like to ask you. Sure. Um, so we'll start with um, with mine. Um, my first question is, which we, we did talk a bit about in terms of power, but um, is there anything else you'd like to say about requirements for CFA in terms of sample size? Uh, uh, yes. Um, so one thing is, I mean, I talked about that all this, the, the, the patterns need to be um, exclusive and disjunct, yeah? So one problem is if you have a structural zero cell. What are structural zeros? 
structural zeros are combinations that are not possible. So if you have many variables, it's, it's not very common, but you might end up with a combination that's not possible, like a blue sky and a heavy rain. <laughs> yeah, something is said. So, I don't know. We are in state college. No, yeah. I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, but um, so sometimes, uh, you know, um, so I know that they are now uh, uh, using it for analyzing um, conversations and interactions in terms of linguistics. And sometimes it's not possible to have certain combinations. Then um, you need to plank out the cells. Yeah, so. In, in the paper, um, in the International Journal of um, Behavioral Development, and we show how to plank out those cells, because it doesn't make sense if you calculate a cell, um, so if you use the cell in terms of calculating the expected frequencies, you can plank out the cell, and then you, you look at the expected frequencies independent of this combination, that's possible. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, submitted question. Is there a statistical equivalency for a CFA solution in a variable centered space, like there is for mixture models um, with K classes um, or factor analysis with K minus one factors or K plus one factors? Um, yeah, it's okay if you can't remember, it's all right. <laughs> so is there a mathematical, yeah. a statistical equivalency for CFA in Ooh. a variable centered? Mm, that's interesting. Well, how, how about uh, latent profile analysis? Um, well, so I think that, I think, Charlie, what you might be talking about in a lane class model, I think the, the more kind of deterministic way of doing LCA would be through like a cluster analysis where mm, there's always a mathematical exactly. solution yeah. as opposed to um, LCA, which is more of like that fit between the model and the... Um, ah, yes, very yeah. good answer, yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So is there one for CFA? <laughs> Well, what you just mentioned, I mean, same thing. Cluster analysis, yeah. yes. I yeah. mean, if you're talking about yeah, continuous variables, you can cluster variables and you can cluster also yeah. uh, person. Yeah. So, Charlie, hopefully that answers your question. If you have more, let us know. Um, next question. Um, what are the prerequisites for finding types or anti-types with regard to the global chi-square or the goodness of fit statistics? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, first of all, um, so that's the difference um, with regard to log linear modeling. In log linear modeling, you're looking for a goodness, a good goodness of fit, um, and that, then the model shows you the structure and dependencies among the data. Yeah, so in configurable frequency analysis, we basically look at residuals mm -hmm. and where's the model not fitting? And where there are significant um, residuals. Actually, if you uh, use uh, log linear modeling and you have uh, standardized residuals, they can be interpreted as the C values. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. um, so, another submitted question For moderated CFA, are there any restrictions regarding sample size differences across the groups? Um, very good questions. And um, I've never came up with any restrictions regarding the sample size, but um, so I mean, it's if there's a big sample in one group and a small in the other group. Actually, I don't know. I have, yeah. 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 Good question. Very oh, good question. stump the presenter. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Other questions. We have at least we have one more that I know of. Um, which is um, would you please explain Again, the idea or concept of pattern frequencies or tabulated data. Yeah, so so um, so the package config needs tabulated data or uh, pattern data. Pattern data means that um, the so we have in each row we have all the combinations, uh, and then in the last column the frequencies, and it, the the variable is. Um, so the combination of the variables is such that the last variable cycles first, we call it. So if, let's say we have one, 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 then it's one, one, two. Then it moves up to the next one, yeah? So one, two, one, one, two, 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 yeah? So mm -hmm. you have to follow um, 
so you have to include all the possible combinations. Yeah, you cannot left the leave out mm. combinations. That's very important. And you have to come up with this, um, you know, hierarchy that the last variable cycles first. Mm -hmm. That's very important. A good question. Yeah, so this is this is actually a bit related question. So a submitted question in the related person-centered method called qualitative comparative analysis, we recognize a problem when possible configurations that are not, rep uh, sorry, with possible configurations that are not represented in the observed data. Is this a problem in configural frequency analysis? Well, um, so does it mean they are not observed and that's why they are not represented or this is not a problem so that means that you have a zero cell and you can have a couple of zero cells or is it what i mentioned before yeah. a structural zero so structural zero cells need to be blanked out they mm -hmm. cannot be included in the analysis mm -hmm. great so we'll we'll take another few seconds so all the questions so far, please, last call. Okay, lovely. Well, um, thank you all very much. Oh, oh yeah, great. Okay, sorry. I thought you were going to slip in a question there right sure, again. Sure. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you all for such nice comments. This is lovely. Um, it's been a real pleasure having you on this fine Halloween um, day here in State College, Pennsylvania. Thank you very much to Mark Stemmler for joining us today. Um, if you are interested in a recording of this webinar to show to your students or colleagues, it will be up on the Methodology Center's website in about a month. Please sign up for our our electronic newsletter on our homepage and you will get an announcement about when it's available. Thank you so much. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you very much. Goodbye. <laughs> Spooky CFA. Spooky I love it. Right. Bye. <laughs> That's nice. Oh, wow. Cute. Yeah. <laughs>